If we think about the fundamentals, loan borrowers have had access to capital markets now for quite some time and as such have strengthened their balance sheets, um, have you know lower leverage, have pushed out maturity. So I think we're starting from a pretty good base. You know, that being said, I think we could start to see idiosyncratic risk, you know, start to creep in. And so whether it's from some of these things that we've been all talking about, inflationary pressures, are they able to pass on uh, these costs to consumers? So there are certain sectors that I think will be more impacted than others, and therefore the active management, individual credit selection is really going to be key. That was Melissa Rico, co-head of Structured Credit Investments at Bearings, and this is Streaming Income a podcast from Bearings. I'm your host, Greg Campion, and today we're diving deep into collateralized loan obligations. My guest today is Melissa Rico. With over 20 years experience investing in the CLO market, Melissa co-heads Bearings Structured Credit Investments Group. In this conversation, Melissa and I dive into how CLOs have weathered recent storms from rising inflation and higher rates to the turmoil in Ukraine. We discuss how the asset class may perform in the next recession and why history might provide some clues. We talk about credit quality in this space today and how it compares to the early pandemic period in 2020, which saw heightened agency downgrade activity. We also discuss how the CLO investor base has changed and the motivation and rationale driving different investor types at different points in the CLO capital stack. Finally, we get Melissa's view on where the best relative value exists today, from senior tranches to mezzanine and between the US and Europe. With that, please enjoy this conversation with Melissa Rico. All right, Melissa Rico, welcome back to Streaming Income. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you. It's been about one year since you were uh, last on the podcast, so uh, very exciting to have you back. There's been um, a lot of developments in markets broadly, and certainly in your space in the CLO market uh, specifically, Um, especially this year. Obviously, uh, this year has started out with a tremendous amount of volatility in markets. We've got tons of things to worry about. We've got rising inflation. We've got rising rates. We've got war in Ukraine. Uh, lots of things to keep investors up at night. So maybe let's start there. Uh, be interested to get your view on, uh, or just to get some context really on how CLOs have weathered this storm, at least uh, to date. Yeah, sure. And I'd say um, CLOs were certainly not immune to the volatility that we've seen year to date. But I'd say the interesting thing is they've actually performed better than most other asset classes other than loans. So, you know, just for context of that, kind of through the end of March, the JP Chloe index showed that um, the CLO capital structure as a whole was down 27 basis points. So, so overall, um, you know, I think that the floating rate aspect of CLOs has kind of helped uh, stabilize our market relative to others, uh, given the, the rising rate environment that, that we find ourselves in. I also think it, you know, it's important just to note that the CLO market has, has come really far to date. We're, we're a $1 trillion market. Um, so, so not one that's easy for, for asset allocators to ignore in, in this uh, environment that we're in. Um, I think you know, it's proved to be a, a robust, uh, well-performing asset class um, you know, to date. Yeah, that's interesting to hear uh, that the asset class has held up uh, so well, especially you know given the the volatility we've we've seen elsewhere. You know, I'm curious if if we think back uh, in terms of you know prior periods of market stress, right? So um, we're heading into this period right now where obviously uh, there's a lot of talk about rising rates. Uh, there's a lot of talk about inflation. You're starting to hear more and more commentators mention the word recession as potentially being in the cards. You and the team here at Bearings have managed portfolios of CLOs through times of uh, market stress uh, in the past. Uh, curious to hear about how you think this time may be similar or different um, than what we've seen in prior you know, periods of stress. 
Sure, yes, there's certainly a number of, of risks to consider as as you mentioned. I would say when you know when thinking about CLOs, I think it is important to kind of step back and sort of think back to the basics of, you know, what a CLO is, kind of to to start off with, you know, CLOs are ultra diversified pools of, of loans, loans that have seniority and, and a capital structure and have historically had high recovery rates with asset coverage. Um, and I say ultra diversified because, you know, that's true for from both an issuer and industry standpoint. For example, in a CLO, an issuer might be 50 basis points. Industries are typically, on average, maybe 10% or less. So I think that that is you know, important as we're, as we're thinking about risk today um, in, in the capital structure. Um, in addition, you know, I, I think volatility has kind of come up, and we're definitely facing that this year, um, increasingly so. And I think the second part to talk about as it relates to CLOs the fact that CLOs are non-mark to market vehicles, right? So in times of volatility, that's where managers can actually take advantage of that volatility by buying loans potentially at a discount. Um, and that value really does accrete to the debt and equity holders of a CLO. So um, again, the fact that these structures are actively managed is, is hugely important. Yeah, um, on the diversification point, you you, uh, you mentioned that CLOs one one way they're diversified is is by sector. Um, I know that going back to over the last couple of years, when we entered a period of stress for energy, you started seeing CLOs being put together with much less energy exposure. Where are we today um, on that front? Yeah, I'd say energy is a, a pretty small percent of an overall CLO portfolio, maybe three to four percent. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that industry, as well as others, are largely discussed in the market. You know, retail, those that are more susceptible to inflationary pressures, consumer products, all of that is is being discussed. But again, I feel like, you know, in our conversations with our managers, they're been, they've been very proactive about trying to trade ahead of these things, and obviously uh, very difficult to do so as, as we sit today. Um, but it's, it's, it's a focus on, on everyone's mind. Yeah, and then you know, back to this idea of recession. I mean, it's obviously quite hard to predict when the next recession may hit. But if you look back, you know, especially with your experience, you know, managing through multiple cycles, I mean, how has the asset class performed in past recessionary periods? Sure, um, it's definitely performed very well, actually. Um, if you kind of look back, we can go back prior to the financial crisis. We've gone through that. We've gone through energy, COVID, Russia, Ukraine, as we sit today, mm. and kind of look. Looking at historical default rates, um, just to give you a context, no double A or triple A have ever defaulted or had a principal impairment. And then if we look down the capital structure, double Bs, which are your lowest rated in the capital structure, have less than a 2% default rate. Um, and so, you know, I think that's pretty telling for the overall performance of the asset class. And these are longer term vehicles. So I think that is also important to note. It's not really about looking at short term um, CLO statistics, if you will. It is really meant to be kind of a longer term vehicle. I'd also just note that, you know, one statistic that S&P recently put out, and I think this was pretty telling as well, um, S&P rated over 16,000 tranches since the 90s. And only 50 tranches defaulted, and 40 of them were pre-crisis. Hmm. So, so that's a, a pretty telling number. And I'd say that since the crisis, the structures of CLOs have only gotten better, stronger in the, in the sense of subordination at every tranche level and also in terms of the collateral. So uh, much less non-loan assets, if you will. A typical CLO can only have you know 5% bonds. Let's talk about credit quality. So credit quality is something that is always in focus for you and for your team and for the market. Sometimes it seems like it's maybe more in focus, uh, at least uh, in the headlines or what markets are doing. So, um, you know, we look back to the early 2020 period when COVID was, you know, first really starting to hit. We saw a lot of uh, agency uh, action taken, a lot of downgrades taken, and some concern in the market around how CLOs would weather the storm. Um, fast forward to today, it seems like the things are in much better shape. Um, it seems like uh, agencies have 
maybe relaxed some of their uh, concerns uh, that they had at the time, um, but perhaps we're heading into a, a, another period of stress. Perhaps we're heading toward a recession. So taking that all into consideration, tell me how you're assessing credit quality uh, today and then how that may compare to you know some past periods of stress. I would say, I mean, always hard to predict rating agency behavior, of course. And if we kind of look back to, you know, what occurred in um, 2020 during the pandemic, I think we could all agree that rating agencies kind of took a a pretty harsh approach um, and obviously a very unprecedented sort of environment that we were in. As we kind of look forward, you know, to this year, I guess that is something, you know, we are thinking about in terms of of the underlying loans. But I would say I would would think that we would be in a much more kind of measured and kind of predictable environment. Loan, if we think about the fundamentals, loan borrowers have had access to capital markets now for quite some time and as such have strengthened their balance sheets, um, have you know lower leverage, have pushed out maturity. So I think we're starting from a pretty good base. You know, that being said, I think we could start to see idiosyncratic risk, you know, start to creep in. And so whether it's from some of these things that we've been all talking about, inflationary pressures, are they able to pass on uh, these costs to consumers? So there are certain sectors that I think will be more impacted than others. And and therefore, the active management, individual credit selection is really going to be key. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And I know that those are real hallmarks of what your team does uh, every day. And not only the structured credit team, but of course, the the much broader uh, high yield and fixed income platforms um, at Bearings. I know you are always leveraging all the uh, the work that the credit analysts here are, are doing. Um, so if we switch gears for a minute and just think about uh, the investor base, uh, I'm curious kind of how that's developed over time. You know, you mentioned that the CLO market is is a trillion dollar market today. So obviously it is one that uh, asset allocators have a hard time not paying attention to. Uh, the asset class is, has gotten much more mainstream uh, over the last kind of decade plus. Um, so it'd be interesting um, to hear, you know, from your conversations, you know, you're, you're a very active participant in this market. You're having conversations with all of these market participants all the time. So what have you seen? How have you seen it develop? And, and you know, who are the, the major types of investors uh, up and down the stack and, and curious kind of what's attracting them. Yeah, I mean, the CLO market definitely would not have been able to grow to, to where it is today if it wasn't for an increase in the in the investor base. Um, overall, I'd say it's, you know, banks at the top part of the stack. You've got insurance, asset managers, pension, hedge fund, you know, a really I would say in the rest of the capital structure, banks just tend to focus more at the AAA level and insurance even to a, to a less degree at the AAA. Um, the one notable thing that we saw last year with the record supply is the increase from U.S. banks, AAAs in particular. They added you know, something to the effect of around $50 billion, you know, of, of paper overall, so it was quite significant. And I think really it just speaks to how attractive CLOs are. Uh, you know, the spread for the rating that you're able to pick up is really hard to beat in any other asset class. And insurance companies in particular, given their risk-based capital framework that they have to live by, um, do find CLO tranches to be attractive given the additional spread pickup that you get for the rating. You know, we've even seen CLO structures designed just for insurance companies um, in, in that they structure it to be more efficient from a risk-based capital standpoint. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, the insurance uh, point is a really interesting one. I mean, that definitely, I know Bearings overall has has been very active in this space on behalf of insurance companies, not least of which uh, is our parent company, Mass Mutual, who we've obviously been managing CLO portfolios uh, for for many years. Um, so if you look up and down that capital stack, so you've got the banks, 
mostly interested at the AAA level. You've got uh, kind of lower down, middle of the stack. You're, you're seeing insurance companies and asset managers, and down at the kind of mezzanine equity level. So that's that's where you're seeing more fast money, kind of hedge fund type players. Is that right? I would say we still see some some hedge funds in the mezzanine part of the stack, but it's been actually more of an increase in real money buyers like asset managers. So asset managers have raised a significant number of equity funds um, in particular, and many of which are designed for that manager's CLO issuance program. So in order for them to bring deals, they're, you know, have the equity already done from their fund. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So so very broad investor base. People have gotten very comfortable with the CLO asset class. Anything else you expect or any other trends you're watching there when it comes to investors and how the investor base may develop, either short term or long term? I, I would just say um, so far this year, U.S. banks maybe have been playing uh, less than they than they did last year. And we are seeing Japanese banks start to come back a a bit. And they've sort of always been playing in the market, but um, we're seeing an increase there as well. So even with the hedging costs that have to be factored in, although they've increased for them, they still look attractive relative to their alternatives. Um, so we talked a little bit about uh, what's going on in the AAA space. You just mentioned, uh, you know, some of the buyers of equity that are out there. So as you look up and down the capital stack within the CLO space, curious um, where you're seeing the best uh, relative value today, and if that's kind of changed. Sure. I think when thinking about relative value in CLOs, I think a case could be made for almost every part of the stack. And it really does come down to the client's risk return profile for the most part. Um, You know, the main reason I say that is because CLOs offer attractive spread relative to other alternatives. But, you know, that relative value within the stack that I think you're kind of talking about does move around and can be different from week to week. So it is always hard to to record these type of, Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Don't worry, we get these podcasts out quick. (laughs) um, But for example, I'd say today we're seeing more opportunities in the secondary market than we've seen in the past. And that's where if we think about that, you know, investor can get their money to work sooner versus waiting for the long settle of a new issue. You could buy discount so you have more upside from a total return perspective. And, and then you can earn potentially a LIBOR coupon versus SOFR coupon, which is currently at about 20 basis points higher. So some of those things I think are attractive, but maybe an offset is your collateral profile may be more seasoned and have and not be as kind of high quality, if you will, as new issue. And then further to that, I'd say looking at different parts of the stack, triple A's and, and double A's just look quite attractive. We're seeing kind of more opportunity here versus single A's and triple B's as those tranches seem to be very well bid in the market right now. And then at the other end of the spectrum, double B's, you can earn two times the spread of a loan. So we think that's quite quite attractive as well. We're seeing yields to maturity of around 10% there. And then in terms of equity, I would say we prefer equity in the secondary market over new issue. Um, triple A's are quite wide at the moment. And so the arbitrage, if you will, for, for equity is a, is a bit ch- challenged for new issue. And I think, you know, if you can kind of look to the secondary, there can be more upside with things like workout equity, um, distressed loans that tend to, to provide additional upside. And lastly, just to uh, maybe mention Europe versus U.S., uh, I'd say, you know, we acknowledge that there is a higher likelihood of a recession in Europe than in the U.S. potentially. But we think the smaller investor base that's in Europe kind of provides um, some opportunity and that there, there seems to be sometimes more of a dislocation in Europe, a kind of mispricing, if you will. Mm. That's great. Appreciate that context. So sounds like really there's opportunity at different parts of the capital stack, really depending on, the, as you said, what your kind of risk return uh, requirements or goals uh, really are. So it sounds like there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. Um, well, that's, this has been great, Melissa. I appreciate this update. Curious uh, kind of what you're watching or what you're going to be keeping an eye on or, or what's next uh, in this market uh, from your perspective. 
Sure. I'd say there's a number of kind of topics um, in, in the CLO market that, that are being kind of talked about. One, manager consolidation. We're seeing a fair amount of that uh, lately. I'd, I'd expect to continue to maybe see more of that. And that's where, you know, private equity and asset managers are looking to diversify their asset base um, and increase their exposure to kind of a stable income stream. And CLOs are a very attractive way to do that. Uh, second, I would say the transition from LIBOR to SOFR is taking place. And I think that's going quite smoothly. Uh, in the CLO market, we've already seen three deals just transition aside from kind of the new issue market. Uh, and third, I would say we continue to have conversations with our managers around ESG and think that there will continue to be more around data disclosure you know, or around this topic. Uh, the fourth, I would say S&P, interesting, proposed a new methodology that impacts risk-based capital for insurance companies. This would be uh, actually quite punitive for CLOs and um, if they're not rated by S&P. So there's significant pushback, as you would imagine, in the market. So more to come on that, but something we're definitely keeping a, a close watch on. And lastly, I'd say, you know, we were watching a new issue arbitrage. And currently there are competing forces for where AAA buyers want to buy and where loan prices are and the fact that loan prices have rallied, but AAAs have stayed wide. And the increased supply of AAAs in the secondary market is definitely not helping the case for a new issue. So overall, I'd say it's, you know, definitely going to be an interesting time in credit. You know, we expect to continue to see volatility, um, more differentiation, uh, which I welcome to some degree, and potential for increased tail risk. So, you know, we're still forecasting defaults to stay below historical levels over the near term. We think it's going to be especially important to have active management, be nimble in times of volatility, and increase focus on fundamentals. Yeah, you know, I think it's it's really encouraging to see uh, how CLOs have really sort of held up in the face of volatility that we've seen uh, year to date. But, uh, you know, maybe that's no surprise given the way that the asset class has performed during uh, past periods of stress. And as you said, there's a lot of reasons behind that, right? There's the floating rate nature, there's the diversification, there's the structural protections. There's a lot of things that uh, that insulate uh, the asset class to some degree. Certainly, there's many risks, as you've uh, highlighted, and there's a lot of stuff to uh, to keep an eye on and pay attention to in the months and years ahead. But um, this has been great, very illuminating for me, and hopefully a really helpful update for our listeners as well. So, Melissa, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for listening to episode number seven of season six of Streaming Income. If you'd like to stay up to date on our latest thoughts on asset classes ranging from high yield and private credit to real estate and emerging markets, please make sure to follow us and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. We publish a new episode every other week. And if you have specific feedback, you can email us at podcast at bearings.com. That's podcast at B-A-R-I-N-G-S.com. Thanks for listening and see you next time.